Today's lecture is going to be looking at comparative genomics. So how do we take this uh, plethora of genomes that is now available and actually begin to ask uh, some really interesting biological questions with them? So today's lecture topic, we're going to be really looking at uh, three kind of big questions. So the first is, what is comparative genomics? You know, how do we define it? Uh, what does it mean? The second is, where are all these genomes coming from? And that's partially answered by our last lectures in the series. And the third thing is to ask the question of, what can you do with comparative genomics? So we're going to look at a number of different snapshots of how comparative genomics has been used to answer some, uh, some quite fun biological questions. If you start at the beginning and say, well, what is comparative genomics? Um, you can kind of do this thing that we say you should never do, which is look up Wikipedia. And if you do that, it says that comparative genomics is the study of the relationship of genome structure and function across different biological species or strains. Now that's uh, completely true, but it's all a bit vague, really, um, and certainly covers a lot of ground. So. We're going to explore a bit about uh, what exactly this means um, in a more practical way. The first thing to note is that comparative genomics needs genomes. You need to have lots of genomes to compare in order to really get at the power of comparative genomics. So what we're looking at here is a series of genomes of a bacterium called Campylobacter. Um, so this is a pretty nasty um, bug that, that can make you quite sick if you get it. Um, and what we're looking at here are, you know, on the outside you've got the main reference genome, and then all of those circles in the middle show different strains of uh, the same species. And so all the little bumps that you can see there indicate that there are sequence differences between those different strains. So. This is an example of comparative genomics. You know, the basic premise is that, is that we're comparing genomic information from different organisms, perhaps within a species, like this example, or perhaps between species. And you might think that genomics is a relatively new thing, and in, in one sense it is, but the first genome sequence was uh, actually developed in 1977. This was again done by our old friend uh, Fred Sanger, and in fact the sequence predates uh, even Sanger sequencing. It used a different technology to get the DNA sequence. But it just goes to show that genomics has been around for a very, very long time. So in this case, uh, the first genome was actually done over 40 years ago. But it is certainly true that when we think of complete genome sequences, this is a relatively new invention. So uh, this figure is, again, a little bit old. It's, it only goes up to 2012. I've, I've not been able to find a newer one in any of the literature. But the trends that you see here um, still hold. So if you look at the bigger outside graph, that's uh, looking at uh, genome sequences of bacteria. If you look at the insert, that's genome sequences of eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotic organisms. Um, and what we're really looking at here is this massive exponential increase in the, in the number of genomes that have been sequenced. And also this kind of idea of, of draft versus finished genomes. So finished genomes are where uh, you basically have the whole genome sequence. A lot of new sequencing technologies, as we've seen in previous lectures, show that um, you can get these sort of draft genomes that have lots of gaps in them, and they're still useful for many applications, but they're, they're certainly not complete. And you can kind of see this trend here, perhaps more clearly in this figure, where a lot of the early genomes that were generated through like the, the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, they were often complete genomes. You know, people put a lot of effort into getting these very, very nice genomes, often with Sanger sequencing, and often with absolutely huge international teams. But since the advent of next generation sequencing, we've seen a lot more of these sort of draft genomes coming along. And there's just been this now exponential increase um, in the number of genomes that are available. So 
So that leads us to this question of where does the power of comparative genomics really come from? You know, what, what are the sorts of things you can do with it? So we're going to spend the rest of this uh, lecture stepping through a number of examples of genomes and comparative genomics and just seeing what sort of biological questions you can ask. So they're all really quite different. Uh, and the point here is to show you a number of snapshots from really different questions from quite different um, realms of biology, but all with this um, all with this basis of comparative genomics. So the first case example is going to be this idea of plant pathogens. Um, plants are obviously they're really important, right? We we eat them; they're a major part of our diet, and they make up over half of the New Zealand economy. You know, we are incredibly reliant on plants in terms of our uh, national income. Most of our crops are monocultures. So you have uh, these enormous fields planted with uh, nearly identical, or sometimes completely identical um, uh, individuals. And that leads to a slight problem, right? Because if one of the plants gets sick, if it gets an infection, then what tends to happen is that they all get sick. So we're going to look at a, a case of a particular pathogen, uh, and this is a paper that came out uh, by Lee Jun Ma uh, a few years ago now, but it's a really nice example, so I sort of want to highlight it. So this is looking at a number of species uh, of a fungal pathogen in the genus Fusarium. So uh, this shows a, a number of different um, species here. So there's Fusarium solani, which is that bottom row of, of uh, images. So this is a, a pathogen of potatoes. Um, F. graminearum, uh, which attacks wheat. F. oxysporum, which attacks uh, tomatoes. And then um, Fusarium verticillioides, which tends to attack sort of corn and maize. And what you can do is you can compare these genomes, right? So we've, we've got the genome sequence of verticillioides and oxysporum, and that's what we're looking at in this figure here. So if you um, look at those black bars, they are the sequence of oxysporum. And then what we've done is we've plotted onto that um, the genome of verticillioides, just to see if it is similar and different. And so if they're similar, that's shown by these, these long stretches of the same color. So if you look at that, that top line, you know, it's mostly red. So chromosome 1 in verticillioides is almost the same as chromosome 1 uh, in, in oxysporum. And there's an easier way to show this, though. And that is by looking at this thing called a dot plot. So on the left, we've got uh, oxysporum. On the bottom, we've got verticillioides. And you walk along the genome, and, and if it's similar, if those two sequences are similar, you basically put a dot on this graph. So if you see a long line of dots, uh, which we're, we're showing in these green boxes, then that's examples where the, the chromosomes match in both species. But in this particular case, there are these really interesting exceptions. So there are at least uh, sort of three or four chromosomes here that are only found in oxysporum. They, they're not found in verticillioides. Um, so in this particular case, it's chromosomes 3, 6, 14, and 15. If we then delve into these and look in a bit more detail, uh, we, we find that they're actually interesting in all sorts of different ways. So for instance, here we're looking at transposable elements. And you can see that most of the chromosomes, and certainly all the chromosomes that are shared between those two species, uh, have relatively low amounts of, of these transposable elements. But the, the four chromosomes that are different, that stand out as not being shared, they've got these very, very high amounts of these transposable elements. And then you can go and look at things like uh, codons. So you'll remember that there's a lot of redundancy in codon usage. So many different codons can code for the same amino acid. And different species have kind of different preferences for, uh, for which codons they use. So here, if you look at the normal chromosomes, 
um, you, you see this kind of blue line on this particular graph. But if you look at the uh, new chromosomes, you've got this red line. Now, this graph is, is just a, a numeric way of showing that the, the codon usage is different between those normal chromosomes in the blue and the new chromosomes in the red. You can also uh, do blast searches for sequences from these uh, chromosomes that are not shared. And they indicate that there are matches, uh, not complete matches, but partial matches in other fungi. So we can tell here that what's happened is that these chromosomes have come into the species. They've been horizontally gene transferred, as it were. Um, and we don't necessarily know exactly what fungal species they've come from, but certainly they've, they've come from outside the Fusarium genus. But the real question is, what do these chromosomes do? And that's what uh, Lee Jun Ma uh, did a very nice experiment to find out. So what we're looking at here is a fungal strain called FOL007, and this contains those extra chromosomes, right? And so if you put the strain into a plant, you find that the plant gets infected and it, it dies. But there's another strain. So this one is uh, FO47. Now this is one where those extra chromosomes have been taken out, right? So it only contains the, the, the chromosomes that are shared uh, between the species. When you do that, uh, you learn a couple of interesting things. First of all is that the fungal strain is perfectly fine. It, it survives. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, have any particular repercussions because those chromosomes are missing. And then the second thing is that if you infect the strain into a plant, it does infect the plant, but it basically has no negative effects. It has no pathogenic effects. And so the plant keeps on living and is perfectly fine. And then you can do this very nice control, which is say, well, now just to confirm what's going on, can we again take that FO47 strain, but now we're going to put those extra chromosomes and we're going to put them back in. So this, this creates a, a new strain called FO47+. Plus. When we do this, it, uh, this new strain, of course, contains those extra chromosomes when we infect that back into the plants, again, you get this really strong pathogenic response and, and the plant in this particular case dies. So when you go uh, looking in a bit more detail, uh, and we're not going to cover this too much here, but you, you find these things called pathogenicity islands, which are sets of genes that encode toxins or, or uh, genes that evade the plant immune system. And you find that these are often clustered in the genome, hence this idea of islands, you know, pathogenicity islands. And when you look at these chromosomes, the, the ones that are not shared between species, these pathogenic chromosomes, as it were, you'll find a lot of these clusters of genes uh, encoding toxins right across all of those particular chromosomes. So now we're going to take a little look at uh, a different case study. So here we're going to be looking at the, the kiwi fruit industry and particularly the role of uh, PSA. So PSA is this major bacterial disease that kills off kiwi fruit vines. Um, and this became a, a major problem in New Zealand a number of years ago because the kiwi fruit industry is absolutely huge. It's a five billion dollar industry uh, at the time, it was about the third or the fourth largest industry in New Zealand. And so this disease uh, had a huge repercussion on the, the economy of the country. And it hurt a lot of individual people. Where, you know, basically their livelihood was wiped out uh, very, very quickly as this disease spread uh, incredibly rapidly across kiwi fruit growing parts uh, of the North Island of New Zealand. And so uh, this PSA, uh, that's a shorthand for this, this uh, species name, so Pseudomonas syringae, um, and then PV stands for pathovar. So it's, it's a particular uh, type of the species that hits this actinidia species, so kiwifruit, right? So it's a particular type of Pseudomonas syringae that then 
attacks kiwi fruit. Now, the really interesting thing is that PSA has been around for ages, and most of the strains that we know of don't really affect kiwi fruit, um, or if they do, they do it in very, very minor ways. And so, when this outbreak occurred, there were lots of really big questions. You know, first of all, do we have a new strain? You know, has this come in from outside the country, or has it evolved uh, here within the country? And also, why is it so bad? You know, what is causing this particular strain to be so damaging? And so what you can do is sequence the genomes and you can line them all up. And so here we've got a, a phylogenetic tree showing the relationship between the strains. And what you can see here is uh, there's a whole lot of diversity here. Um, there's a number of these so-called low virulent strains, so ones that don't really cause any damage, so that's in green. Uh, there are strains that are found uh, overseas, uh, so in Korea, that's in, in purple, and in Japan in blue. And then there's this kind of what we call the outbreak strain. So this, this major strain that uh, spread and, and caused all this damage. And if you just look at that strain in a bit more detail, um, it shows this really characteristic pattern, this thing we call a star-like phylogeny, right? Because that, that burst at the bottom looks a bit like a star. And that's a sign of a very rapid expansion. And this is incredibly characteristic of major outbreaks where uh, a new strain comes in, it spreads very rapidly, and you have all of these lineages that are only uh, a bit different from each other. So in this particular case, these various strains that we're looking at here um, are only differ by a few bases across the entire genome. Um, and the really interesting thing is where they're found. So if you look at the, um, the, the names on that graph, there are almost identical strains in, in Chile, in Italy, and in China, and of course in New Zealand. What you can then do is you can take all of these strains um, and you can line up all the genomes and the, gene, the genes and, and begin to compare them. And so what we're looking at here are uh, all of the different genes um, in all of those different genomes. And they're kind of classified as to whether they're found in the low virulent strains in, in green or the Korean strains in purple. Or the one to really keep an eye on is this outbreak strain, which is shown in red. And then they're classified as the, to whether they're found um, in some of those groupings or, or not. So, for instance, on the left, we see that there are 4,425 genes that are found in every species. Right? There are a whole lot of genes that, if you don't have it, you can't survive. Right? So that's kind of the core uh, genome of this group of organisms. But if you look on the right-hand side, there are a whole lot of genes that are shared uh, between some of those groupings, and, and, uh, but not between others or are unique to particular groupings. And right at the top, there are, uh, there's a little red bit of the circle uh, that shows that there are 313 genes that are only found in the outbreak strains and not found uh, in any of the other species or, or strains in this particular case. When we look at these, we find that many of them are pathogenicity genes. So just like that Fusarium example that we looked at a little bit earlier. The key point we want to make here is that you can only identify these genes by looking at lots of genomes. So if, if we had managed to get the genome of the outbreak strain, but none of these other genomes, we would have had this mass of nearly 5,000 genes. Well, no, actually much more than that. Many, many thousands of genes. And we wouldn't have known which are the ones that are potentially uh, causing the major damage in this particular outbreak. This comparative approach has allowed us to really narrow it down from thousands of genes down to just 300. And so all of a sudden, you've got a much smaller set of genes to work with, and you can start doing that really critical biology to figure out what's going on and how can we stop this particular outbreak. Let's turn now to, uh, again, a completely different case study. So this is the idea of um, evolving vision. So when you think of vision or sort of eyesight, it's, it's a fundamental feature of most animals. So it's, it's very rare to have animals that don't have some sort of uh, vision or sight. But over time, animals are 
really interesting and that they can change their vision to suit their environment. So you can begin to ask these questions about um, how does the environment changing then relate to changes in the, the genes. So if you think back to your basic biology, uh, it's really interesting that there are these, um, these cones, right? These are the fundamental part of, of vision within eyes. And if you remember back, there's, there's two different types. There's these rods, which are mostly looking at black and white, so very um, basically whether there is light or not. And they are typically used in low light conditions. And then there's often these, these color ones, uh, which are used in high light conditions. And then that can tell you, uh, you know, whether you're seeing reds or blues or greens, you know, all the colors. If you look at the rods, the, the main protein that's really important for this is this thing called rhodopsin. Uh, so here's a picture of rhodopsin here. Now, there's this interesting case of where you have uh, fish living in the deep sea. So these, these are not fish living up near the, the ocean surface where a little bit of light trickles down, but they're living way, way down in the bottom where it's very, very dark. There's very little light that still filters in uh, from the open sky. And so they have to have this very unique vision um, in order to kind of survive in these incredibly low light uh, conditions. And what we've seen here is this expansion uh, of this rhodopsin gene family in deep sea fish. And the, there are a couple of curious things that have happened here. So the first is that we see a lot of independent and repeated evolution. So the same genes are changing in similar ways in quite differently related species. The second thing is that you're seeing this hyperduplication. So that rhodopsin gene we've just seen has been duplicated many, many, many times to create a whole lot of new variants. And this is uh, just one representation of some of these variants. So this is, a, a, again, a sort of a schematic of the rhodopsin gene. And what you can see in those colored dots are uh, key mutations. Uh, so these are particular tuning sites where if you change the, uh, the amino acid, you can actually end up with quite a different uh, effect in terms of light detection. So here's another schematic that shows the same sort of thing in a slightly different way. So what we're looking at here on the, the top on the right hand side are uh, a whole lot of different gene variants. So these have been duplicated and then they've been slightly mutated. And what you can see is those mutations allow that particular rhodopsin to pick up uh, a different area of, of wavelengths. So if you look at these curves on the left hand side, so the, you know the W's and D's, they're more tilted towards your purples and blues. If you look at the ones on the right-hand side, so the ZAs, the ZBs, they're more tilted towards uh, the, the sort of yellows and the reds. And they're all sort of centered, though, on this, this bit in the middle, this kind of uh, sort of light blues. And that's really important because in the deep ocean, um, the residual daylight, so the amount of light that actually gets down to the ocean, it, that's in the kind of wavelength area that you, it, it occurs. And also a lot of bioluminescence, which also occurs uh, fairly commonly in the deep ocean, tends to be in those sorts of wavelengths. So what we're looking at here is recurrent evolution of uh, effectively color vision. So we've taken this rhodopsin, which is typically low light, sort of um, light versus no light or black versus white, um, and instead, it's been slightly tweaked so that these fish can get a kind of pseudo color vision, um, even in the deep, deep ocean. Now, one of the kind of fun things is that you can uh, put all these uh, genes and align them. And you can look at uh, the evolutionary history, the phylogenetic tree of these different variants. And so what you see here is that if you go back about 40 million years, it was only uh, one sort of variant of rhodopsin, and it kind of split. And so uh, it duplicated one variant, then sort of went on this evolution trajectory down the bottom, going into the blues, you know, the, the dark blues. The other one went on this trajectory in the top and went into the light blues and the greens. So what we have here is an example of gene duplication, uh, sub-functionalization. 
So where these gene duplicates, these gene copies can change and take on a new function that their uh, sort of ancestral form didn't have. And you can begin to look at this trajectory of change over evolutionary time. Now, although you can find these different variants, or at least some of them, in, in one or a single species, we could only really figure this out by looking at a whole lot of species. Uh, and that allowed us to see all of these diff different variants and therefore be able to figure out uh, this kind of really fascinating story about uh, a new form of evolution of light detection. Here's another uh, case example, again, a completely different one, just to, to highlight the importance of comparative genomics. So here we're looking at uh, these, these really interesting bits of the genome called ultra-conserved or accelerator regions. Um, ultra-conserved means they're not changing very much, accelerator means they're changing very, very fast. So bits of the genome change especially fast or especially slow. The genome, the genome always changes, right, but, but this is fast or slow uh, relative to that kind of background rate. Now, one of these examples is that uh, of these is these kind of sort of ultra conserved regions, uh, which are regions that just haven't changed very much for a very long time. And the question is, can we use comparative genomics, so comparing genomes between species, to get a bit of an indication of what these uh, sequences might actually do? So when you look at these ultra conserved regions, you find that they have persisted for a very, very long time. So um, humans are indicated on this graph, so we're right down the bottom, that HG19, so that's one of the recent genome references for humans. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of conservation between uh, sort of different, uh, different populations of humans, so Koreans, Chinese, HG19 is a European. And then you can see conservation with chimpanzee and gorilla and, and, and monkeys. That's probably not that, that surprising, but what you find here is that there are bits of the genome, there are matches of these ultra-conserved regions that go all the way back to things that are very different to, from us. So to, to hedgehogs and elephants and even to things like, um, you know, platypus, which is a marsupial, um, zebra finches, so, so birds, you know, animals, which are um, sort of lizards. And then this figure shows that going, uh, the conservation going even further back. So um, not only have we had this conservation all the way back through mammals, but in fact we have conservation of some regions of our genome all the way back into things like insects and fungi. So the question then becomes, you know, what do these things do? So the general thinking is that if they're conserved, they must have a purpose, they must have a function. And so what we're looking at here is um, a sequence, there's obviously a mouse, but behind it there's a sequence of this particular ultra-conserved region called UC467. It's a 731 base pair region that's conserved, so perfect conservation, 100% identity between human, mouse, and rat. So the, the, the idea was this must be really, really important. And to be conserved that long, it must have some critical function. So what they did uh, is they went and they knocked it out in, in mice. And this is an example of the mouse that has this sequence deleted. And as you can see, the effect was absolutely nothing, right? This mouse is perfectly fine. That shows absolutely no difference to any other normal mouse. So in this particular case, it looks like this sequence is not functional, or at least it's not functional in any sort of phenotype that uh, was tested or became immediately apparent during the lifetime of this particular individual mouse. But we do know that some of these regions are functional. So here's uh, another study, this time really looking at what are called accelerator regions. So this is where you've got uh, an ultra-conserved region uh, that hasn't changed uh, in a number of individuals, but in, in one species it has changed. So the, the, the sequence example here, shown down in that sort of bottom right, 
is that there's a sequence that's in gray and that's identical in humans and pica and sheep and aardvarks and even into wallabies, right? So back into marsupials. And it's identical in all of them except for elephants. And elephants have got four different changes uh, highlighted in that pink color. Now that, that's really quite unusual. And so the idea is, can we use the traits of these species uh, to begin to predict maybe what some of these sequences might do and, and therefore, you know, what, what they might do in humans. So if we take a look at this, we're, again, we're looking at this example of uh, a sequence that is conserved basically in everything except in elephants. And this particular region, when you really go and start looking at it, turns out to enable uh, improved DNA repair. And this is interesting because um, when it's this particular region is disrupted in humans, and of course this is not done on purpose, but there are individuals who are unfortunate enough to be born with disruptions in this genetic locus, then that is often linked to higher rates of cancer. Elephants, of course, are quite interesting in that they, they're very long-lived, very large animals, um, so they've got lots of cells, but actually they've got very, very low rates of cancer. And one of the reasons is they've got this really good uh, DNA repair system that's even better than, than humans. Um, and this particular region appears to be one of the benefit or one of the regions that, that provides that particular benefit. And then you can start looking at all of these other regions and the species where they are changed versus all the others where they're conserved. So you you start seeing that uh, the regions that, for instance, are um, changed in bats, when you look at where those regions are changed in humans, so again, in this kind of medical setting, um, they're often associated with things like uh, pointy ears or finger fusing, right? Suggesting that these regions are actually really critical for particular phenotypes. Um, patterned albinism is... Uh, a pattern that sort of comes up in squirrels, but it's seen in humans when there's variations at those particular ultra-conserved locations. Uh, glaucoma in the naked mole rat uh, changes in immune function when you compare it to dolphins. So um, this is an example where if you just had the human genome, you wouldn't be able to figure out what these regions did. In fact, you wouldn't even recognize them, right? Because you, wouldn't be able, you can only tell if something is ultra-conserved or changed by comparing it with other genomes. But here they've gone one step further to say, well, let's look at the species where these genomes have, or these loci have changed, and then begin to predict a little bit about what those changes might be doing. This is the... The last example that I, I want to walk you through, um, and again, it's a quite interesting uh, example, this time from medical genetics. So we're, go we're going to be looking at this idea of cancer phylogenetics. So where does this all come from? It, it comes from this idea that finding the genetic causes of cancer is just really, really hard. There's, there's a good reason why we haven't made um, much progress um, at least in a big sense, in terms of curing cancers. And part of the reason is that cancer is really a situation where cell growth starts, cells start growing proliferatively, they just sort of take over. And there are all sorts of genetic changes that can trigger that to happen. So not every gene, but sort of almost any gene could be the fundamental problem for any particular cancer. Now, the way we used to do this was looking gene by gene. So people had their favorite candidates, and you would go in to look at uh, a particular gene. But of course, there are on the order of 25,000 genes in the human genome. So looking gene by gene is just uh, not a feasible way, both in terms of time and expense, in terms of diagnosis. So next generation sequencing, though, provides an, an interesting alternative. So the key point to keep in mind here is that cancer is not just a single thing. So people can carry multiple genomes within themselves, depending on, on what the cancer is. So what we're looking at here is a particular uh, example of a cancer. 
in that kind of red tissue, that's the normal tissue, that's non-cancerous, um, so normal healthy tissue. And then we've got an example of, say, a primary tumor shown here on the right-hand side, and then a whole lot of secondary tumors, so so-called metastases. So where a bit of the primary tumor has broken off, some cells have floated somewhere else, and then they've started proliferating to form a new tumor. And there's this lovely paper um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, so again, a very good journal, uh, looking at the evolution of these tumors as they break away from the primary tumor and form new tumors elsewhere in the body. So here we're looking at um, a primary tumor on the kidneys, but then it's, it's moved away and now there's uh, new tumors on the chest wall and in the lungs. And what you can do is you can sequence uh, the genomes of these different tumors, uh, which is what we're looking at here. So uh, most of the genomes are very similar, but there are genes that are changed or, or yeah, that are changed that or broken in some of these tumors and not in others. So what we're looking at here is that there's a whole lot of, if you look on the left, there's a whole lot of genes, and they're kind of shown in, uh, in that gray, that gray block there, that are uh, basically the same, and so they're all working functional genes in all of these different tumors. And then if you look sort of uh, about a quarter of the way along, there's a little block of blue, and that's showing genes that are changed, so broken or damaged, in, in the primary tumor. And then as you go to the right, you find genes that are broken or damaged in um, the, uh, the shared metastases. So that, that's tumors that have moved from the primary to a secondary location, but they're more closely related to each other. And then there are changes that are only found in, say, one or two tumors, or only in this particular case, a single tumor. So those are those so-called private mutations shown by the, the red highlight. Um, and then in the figure below, we're looking at a phylogenetic tree of this. So the, the blue line indicates the normal tissue. So basically the, what you would think of as the genome sequence of this particular individual. And then all of the changes that have occurred to lead to the other tumors that have been sequenced. So these, you know, the M1s and the, the R9 and R5. And then what's laid over this uh, are the genes that have changed, right? So this is kind of very interesting and it's worth looking to this in a bit of detail. So what you can see here is that, again, in that normal tissue, tissue you've got those ubiquitous genes, so the ones that are basically um, changed in all of the tumors. Then you've got these ones in the yellow, which are shown in the shared uh, for, for one of those branches of the tumors, and then green being the other branch, and then you've got these sort of red little blips at the end, which are the genes that have changed in, in just a few of the, the tumors. And you can look at these particular genes, and you'll see that the key change here was on that normal tissue branch, okay, so in the blue, and this is the VHL gene. So that was probably the, the primary trigger that started uh, this particular bout of cancer. But then you can see that there are then subsequent changes in, um, in other tumors. So if you look at that lower green branch, you see that there's a missense mutation in the set D2 gene. There's a splice site change in the KDM5C gene. If you look in the, in the yellow, um, so that's in that sort of upper branch, uh, you find that there's a frame shift in the set D2 gene, there's a missense in mTOR, there's a missense in frame shift in KDM5C. And one of the really interesting things here is that you, you see some of these genes coming up again. So we're looking at two independent breakings of the set D2 gene, two independent breakings of the KDM5C gene. You might say, well, why does this matter? And it matters because uh, a lot of drug treatments and, and chemotherapies and various other specific treatments um, will affect 
tumors that contain some of these gene variants and not others. So what effectively you have here is not one cancer tumor, but a whole lot of different tumors that are similar to each other, but slightly different. And so maybe you have a, a drug that uh, is very effective at wiping out uh, the tumors from that, um, from that green branch, but possibly it's not effective when you have the mTOR uh, mutation. And so there's no effect on the yellow branch, and so that cancer still proliferates. This is one of the reasons why cancers are so very, very hard um, to, to address in a, in a therapeutic sense. So we've just looked at a whole lot of different case studies of comparative genomics. Uh, and, and they're all over the place, right? So we looked at plant pathogens, we looked at uh, medical examples, we looked at uh, deep, deep sea fish vision, right? So, so what are the commonalities or the key points that you should be taking home from this particular, um, this particular set of examples? And I think I would make four key points here. The first is that um, comparing genomes re reveals features that you could not find using just one genome sequence. So we saw that with PSA, where um, you had to line up the genomes to find out what are the genes that are found specifically in that outbreak strain. Uh, or the ultra-conserved regions in humans, where you can't tell if a region is ultra-conserved unless you can compare it to other genomes. So having a whole lot of genomes available is an incredibly powerful tool, and that's where uh, genomics has really changed really over just the last few years, so maybe the last five to ten years. The second point I would make is that uh, genome sequences are becoming increasingly common. You know, it's now almost trivial to generate a genome sequence. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of human genome sequences out there, and you can get a genome sequence from almost anything you like. Um, it does take work, it does take time, still takes a little bit of money, but it's certainly feasible um, for almost any research group anywhere in the world. And that means that these comparative methods, these comparative genomics methods, are going to be accessible to a whole lot of groups uh, that perhaps wouldn't have been able to take this approach uh, even five or ten uh, years ago. The third point is this idea of uh, comparative genomics uh, being this kind of compare and contrast approach. So it's all down to be able to line up genomes and say, how do these genomes, either from within a species or between species, how do they differ? How are they similar? That doesn't necessarily answer the biological question, but it does at least get you from a stage where you've got an entire genome in front of you. For humans, that's four billion base pairs and at least narrows it down to, well, here is, you know, a few hundred regions that seem to be really, really important for this particular biological question. So it's a, it's a winnowing device, uh, a way of enriching um, the regions that you look at to be uh, much better or much more likely to give you your, your biological answer. And the, the fourth point I would make is that uh, these comparative genomics methods are very likely to dominate uh, most future biological research. So they're an incredibly powerful approach. They haven't been used in the past um, terribly much simply because we couldn't get the genomes. We didn't have the technology. Now that that technological barrier has been uh, broken, it means that we can now start using these comparative genomics approaches. And I think we will start finding that a lot of the other methods that have been used in the past uh, will go away and these will, these comparative genomics approaches will be used to replace them. An example being for that last um, case study with cancer, it's very unusual now to see a candidate gene approach for studying cancer. Instead, it's almost by default that you would go in and sequence the genome and use that as your starting point. So this is the, um, the last lecture in uh, this series of three. Um, and the key purpose was really just to give you a bit of a view about comparative genomics. And, you know, in the earlier lectures, we were talking about next generation sequencing technologies and then all the applications you can do with them. I just really want to bring you back to this idea of what uh, amazing power these, these genomes have when you can line up lots and lots of genomes and give you a bit of an inkling about what your careers might look like 
if you move into genetics or really any field of biology um, from this point forward. It's going to look very different to the way biology has been in the past. And I think that's a really exciting thing to focus on. So uh, keep an eye out for comparative genomics. It's really important. It's going to get even more important, and it's a good thing to know about.